Good afternoon. Thank you uh, for coming. I must say it's, uh, it's a privilege and it's a pleasure to be back at Regent University. I spent 15 uh, happy and productive years here in the School of Government, and uh, it's a delight to be back. And uh, so thank you for your attention and your presence here. I look forward to spending uh, an hour or so with you. And um, I'm going to speak about George Washington and slavery. It's a complicated topic, and so I won't be able to cover all of the nuances of it, but I, I hope to hope to talk about really four aspects of Washington and slavery. And the first to just be to put slavery in its context, slavery and the founding, and spend a few minutes on that. And then uh, we'll look at the revolution, Washington's uh, thought processes and his activities vis-a-vis -vis slavery during the revolution and as commander in chief of the Continental Army. And then the constitution. And here, um, I'm gonna depart from the book if you have it, I know you've, you've been assigned portions of it. And if you don't have it, um, there are lots of copies available on Amazon and uh, bookfinder.com used, like for a dollar. And uh, they'll, they'll say things like, uh, never been opened, uh, spine has never been cracked, still in shrink wrap. So uh, if, if you're interested, you can have it for pennies on the dollar. But um, so if you're familiar with the book, I don't really talk very much about the Constitution. I thought maybe I ought to depart from that. You can read as well as I can read to you. There's no, there's no need for me to do that. So I thought maybe we'd spend a little bit of time talking about the Constitution. Of course, Washington presided over the convention that created that Constitution of 1787. And uh, it might be worth asking ourselves, was it a pro-slavery constitution? Was it a white supremacist constitution as to use today's lingo? Or was it an anti-slavery constitution? Or did it partake of both uh, postures? So I'd like to help you think through that just a little bit. And we'll look at one, just one section in particular, Article 1, Section 9, uh, the famous uh, clause that has to do with the the uh, protection of slavery for 20 years for one generation. And then uh, in retirement, Washington's retirement years, and in particular, his last will and testament, which was as much a political, it's sort of the, the postscript to his famous farewell address. It's a, it's a, a private document, but it's one that has uh, very clear political public implications, I think. And then, and then we'll reserve a little time for conclusions, questions. And I should, should say, by the way, um, I'm happy to ha make this more interactive. I, I needn't stand up here and lecture you for the next 45 minutes or so. So if you have uh, things you'd like to interject or questions, um, uh, feel free to do that. So, so I'll, I'll recognize you if, you if you want to do it. If it gets, if it interrupts, I'll just stem the flow if there are too many of them, but uh, I want you to feel the, at liberty to do that, okay? Well, um, I, should also, I should also thank Dr. Redinger and uh, the university, the Jack Miller Center, that is uh, funding this event and this whole series, the Lincoln Program. And I looked over last year's program and this, and uh, I think it's, it's much needed in our society. Things like this are much needed. Uh, universities like this are needed because we are suffering as a people from a mental illness. And I'm afraid all of you in the room have got it too. Uh, I've got it. Um, and there's, there's no vaccine for it. And there's no booster for it um, other than what you are doing. And that is study, the hard work of reading and cogitating and wrestling with these things. So uh, we commend the Jack Miller Center, Regent University, Dr. Redinger, this program. And again, I, I just think we're indebted to all of those institutions. Well, I said we're suffering from historical amnesia, and, and I think there's a lot we can learn from Washington, our, uh, our first national leader and our greatest by my lights. Um, I should say I've been thinking a lot about this. I'm, I'm very grateful for the chance to, to think through it with you. I'll just spend a second on this. I've got some connections to George Washington. I'm not related to him by blood. Nobody is. There aren't, any, there aren't any descendants of George Washington running around. There, if you meet somebody who claims that, you know they're a fraud right away. Like, like a person who says their famous, famous uh, favorite symphony is like the 10th symphony of Beethoven or something. But uh, I do have a table that, that 
came from Mount Vernon. It's in my dining room, and I came by it legally at an auction. So, so I've been thinking, I've been thinking about Washington. I've been thinking uh, a lot about slavery and the founders. And so a week ago today, I published a piece in the public discourse. It's my first foray into the culture wars, and it's called Damnatio Memoriae. Princeton's Witherspoon statue controversy. And Dr. Redinger was kind enough to mention my book on Witherspoon. I spent a year teaching at Princeton, and that statue was newly installed in the years I was there. And there's a movement afoot to take it down, to move it, because Witherspoon, for a few years, owned two slaves. And so I, I, it gave me an opportunity to think about slavery and the founders. And, and this is a phrase, it's a Roman phrase. Uh, it means the condemnation or the damnation of memory. And the Romans did something that these Princeton uh, grad, philosophy students in, 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 uh, in the graduate school got up this petition. And uh, the Romans did something similar. They decapitated or defaced statues of their emperors and public figures who had fallen out of favor. So I mean, uh, all of that to say, I've been thinking about this uh, recently. So let's, let's dive in, shall we? And the first thing uh, I think to take notice of um, is that all societies have good and evil in them. Here's a line from Krev Kur, right? The uh, sort of the, the Tocqueville of the 18th century, Krev Kur was, who said, good and evil are to be found in all societies and it is in vain to seek for any spot where these ingredients are not mixed. I think that goes for individuals as well. So in vain do we search for a perfect founder. So if the standard is perfection, that's never going to be found, right? That's utopian, utopian, utopia. You know what that word means, don't you? Utopia. I'll bet you do. If you had Dr. Redinger or Dr. Tell me your name again. Dr. Wolf. Yeah, I thought you were like the offensive line coach or something, but <laughs> I've decided to see. Delighted to see you've got brains in addition. Brains and brawn right there. All right. So utopia. U is a privative. Topos, like a topographical map. It's no place, right? A utopia is literally no place. You will never find it on this earth. So let's not be utopian when we think about Washington and, and slavery or the founders in slavery. So that's kind of just a little preface for us. Well, Washington, as you know, uh, I presume you know, inherited slaves. Slavery is not, was not endemic uh, merely to the British North American colonies. Uh, as far back as writing will take us, we've had writing for about, as a race, as a human race, for about 6,000 years. And go back and look at ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, what will you find? Slavery there. Here's a steely with, I think that's called a steely. Uh, a slave market opened by Egyptians, right? So here are Africans being enslaved. Africans enslaved Africans. Africans here enslaved Native American peoples. Native Americans enslaved Africans. Whites enslaved whites, yeah? In ancient Greece, in Rome. Uh, Muslims enslaved Christians. Slavery has been a, a human problem from the very beginning. As far back as writing will take us, we have slavery. And, and if you think slavery is over, you just need to look at the headlines, right? There's a thriving slave trade, a sexual trade, right? Just, just as loathsome as many other forms of slavery today, this very day. So it is a human problem. How did Washington wrestle with it? How did he deal with it? That's what we want to look at in the next 35 minutes or so here together. Well, the first thing to note is that uh, Washington was born into a slave society, and he himself inherited the first slaves that came under his control. His father, Augustine Washington, was a modest farmer. Uh, it's a myth that Washington was born into riches like Jefferson was, for example, or uh, some of the other founders. His father's estate uh, listed seven able-bodied slaves at, at Augustine's death. And those passed first to, to uh, Washington's elder half-brother, Lawrence, the oldest of the first marriage of his father. He, Washington, was the eldest child of the second marriage. But those then came under his control at the death of his sister-in-law. 
<clears throat> and then, of course, Washington married. Relatively young, by the way, I'm going to come back to this later. I want you to hold on to that. Washington was in his 20s when he married Martha, as, as she was, a young widow, uh, but reputedly the wealthiest widow in Virginia. And there, there I think, 84 slaves, so-called dower slaves, came under his control. So he inherits slaves. Now, that's not to say that he didn't purchase them and didn't try to build up that uh, that, that trade in, in, in human commerce. He did. <clears throat> but my take is that Washington was always a reluctant slave owner. He was, as um, someone to whom I owe a great debt, Dr. William Allen, Dr. Bill Allen, um, probably done more than any single person to help form my notions of Washington and uh, a, a truly great scholar. Do you know Bill Allen? Uh, I know of him. Well, I hope you have the privilege sometime to, to meet him in person. Um, he was the dean of the James Madison College at Michigan State for many, many years, and uh, an African-American scholar of uh, penetrating intellect. And he's taken a lot of flack for some of his stances from, uh, from the left in particular. But um, Bill Allen has done pioneering work in George Washington, uh, helped to uh, piece together Washington's discarded first inaugural, for instance, make that available to scholars and has written some extremely penetrating works on, on Washington. And I, I owe him a great debt. Um, but uh, as, as Bill has pointed out, well, I'll hold off on that. I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in just a moment. Um, Washington was a queasy slaveholder. That's Bill Allen's phrase from the very beginning, and I, I concur with that analysis. But we begin to see, so let, let's say Washington as a, as a young aspiring planter seemed to have the race prejudices of persons in his station here in Virginia, right? Um, and yet we see beginning in, during the revolutionary period and, and continuing throughout his presidency then, and his retirement years in particular, and up, up to the drafting or, or at least updating of his will in July of 1799, some six months before his death, an evolution in thinking, a maturation in thinking, a moral maturation, an intellectual maturation with respect to slavery. So let's start with the revolution, shall we? And I'm going to well, all right, let's start with the Civil War. I was going to start with the Revolution, but let's start with the Civil War. I'm, I'm sure you've seen this, being Virginians. Have you? This is the great seal of the Confederacy. And uh, who is in the center there? Obviously, Washington is in the center, right? Curiously, in his Revolutionary War uniform. And, uh, well, what's the date on that? 22 February, 1862. Why 22 February? We're the 20th, but yes, sir. It, it is his birthday, yes. It's his birthday new style. Uh, we won't get into the Gregorian calendar or any of that, but it's his birthday new style, yeah. By the way, happy President's Day. You know, the official, the official government holiday is George Washington's birthday. It is not called President's Day. President's Day is a colloquial phrase for so that Abraham Lincoln can hawk used cars and Washington can, we can have sales and stuff like that. The official government holiday is still Washington's birthday. So why did the Confederates put Washington in the center of their great seal? Why did they uh, coin it, I suppose, or mint that seal on 22 February, 1862? It's a conscious effort, isn't it, to conscript Washington into the Confederate cause. As if to say, had Washington been alive in 1862, he would have been on our side. He would have been a Confederate. We're doing just what they did, those patriots of old, of 76, right? We are fighting against a tyrannical central power, which we consider to be illegitimate, and we are going to secede from that, just as the colonies did in 1776. It's completely wrong, I think. Uh, Washington is the most inapt of the founders to use as the centerpiece for a Confederate great seal. They'd have done much better to put Thomas Jefferson in there. And we're just gonna see in a moment how, 
how Washington and Jefferson already are uh, beginning to think differently about slavery and individual slaves. So I wanna humanize this a little bit. Here's a painting you probably have seen. It's oft reproduced, Washington uh, there with slaves in the background and his, one of his many farms. He had five farms. Modern day Mount Vernon is just a very little small slice of the properties he had up there. Five contiguous farms. So in the revolutionary period, in the run up to the revolution, one of the things that Washington did was to co-author with George Mason, for whom the university is named, something called the Fairfax Resolves. Possibly have heard of those. And uh, Washington took, if not an equal part, a vigorous part in the drafting of those. One of the many myths of Washington that needs exploding is that he was uh, just a big dumb jock. Wasn't very smart, but 6'4", in those days, gargantuan, wore a uniform well, extremely athletic, uh, extremely physically powerful, great powers of endurance. Jefferson called him the finest horseman of the age. Uh, I don't know if you've been around horses ever. My wife and I have some. My father's people were cattle ranchers and horsemen. Uh, it takes strength to ride a horse well. Um, but what we tend to think, yeah, he had all these physical virtues, but, you know, not the sharpest knife in the drawer. He needed Hamilton. He needed James Madison. He needed smart young men around him to do his thinking for him and his brightest speeches for him and whatnot. Well, Washington took a very vigorous part in the drafting of these Fairfax resolves. And George Mason was, by all accounts, the leading constitutional thinker in Virginia. Washington had an almost co-equal role with, with Mason in drafting these. So what is one of the articles that they put in there? This one here that says, no slave ought to be imported into any of the British colonies on this continent. And some scholars have said, well, yes, because that would drive up the price of domestic slaves. So this was purely a kind of uh, Beardian you know, uh, move whereby they're just trying to increase the value of their own slaves. But they give a reason why immediately after that. It's our earnest wish, right? To see an entire stop forever put to such a, what, profit? No, wicked, cruel, and unnatural trade. So already, before, before independence is declared, right? Washington is aiding George Mason in drafting these resolves and going on record as saying that slavery is what? Wicked, cruel, and unnatural. That is to say, it's contrary to the laws of nature and nature's God, as the Declaration of Independence will, will phrase it uh, two years hence. All right, now let's... Let's fast forward just a little bit. So the revolutionary period is heating up. There's Mason and Gunston Hall. You ought to go visit it next time you're up in Northern Virginia. When Washington was appointed uh, commander in chief of the Continental Army, he came into at least uh, epistolary con contact with this woman, Phyllis Wheatley, one of the most remarkable characters of the American founding period. This is the frontispiece. It's the only image we have of her uh, to her book, quote, Poems on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral, published in 1773. And she was a poetess. Uh, she wrote, well, moral and religious <laughs> and biographical sometimes uh, works. And she, when uh, George Whitfield, the great evangelist, the first great awakening evangelist died. She wrote a, an encomium to me, to him rather. And uh, she also wrote one to George Washington, not on his death, but uh, upon, his, um, upon his appointment as commander in chief. <clears throat> and in that, well, let me back up. So in order to get her books published in those days, as in today, you wanted to get famous people, well-known people to sort of write a dusk jacket blurb kind of. So she, Phyllis Wheatley, writes to Washington. By this time, he's uh, commander in chief. He's, in, he's been stationed in Boston. Uh, what passed for a Continental Army was encamped on the commons there in, in the 
in, in Boston. And she writes him and she says, I've written this poem for you and uh, I, would, I would appreciate it if you would endorse it publicly and I'll get a publisher will help me with sales and so forth. And she sent it to him and uh, his, his, his uh, response to that is remarkable. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole poem to you. You can find it. Uh, but uh, uh, suffice it to say that it contained a couplet, two lines in which uh, Ms. Wheatley recommended for Washington a crown and a throne. That's a very, it's, it's a very, it's an encomium. It's full of praise for Washington, whom she knows is a slave owner. And, and, but she writes him this request. Now, I want to show you Washington's response to her. So that this is dated February 76, right? It's even before the Declaration. And then we're going to compare it to Thomas Jefferson's treatment of, of Miss Phyllis, as she was known sometimes. So I've, I've highlighted a few phrases there in words. So he writes back and he, and he thanks her for sending this poem and he praises her literary talents. The elegant lines that you've enclosed for me, it, they're proof of your great poetical talents. Your genius, he says, it's an instance of your genius. Uh, and I, I would be happy if you ever should come to Cambridge, that's Cambridge, Massachusetts, right? It's where, it's where Harvard is. That's where, again, where the army was encamped. I shall be happy to see a person so favored by the muses. The muses are these uh, demigod-like characters, right? From Greek mythology. And to whom nature has been so liberal and beneficent in her dispensations. So you see the great respect with which he treats her, right? And, and her, for her intellectual accomplishments and talents, right, and capacities. Uh, the best evidence is that she accepted his invitation and they met on Boston Common and they, they dined together. It's one of the first instances of which I'm aware, in which a white male in power entertains, right, an African-American female. By the way, he turned her down and he did it very politely, but his rationale was that if, if I were to blurb your poem, uh, I would be open to the imputation of vanity, he says. Now, I think there's something else going on, and I think he's, he's paying her a very high compliment here. He's asking her to read between the lines, see? So yes, yes, he says, I think it would be vain of me, or I could be, I'd be open to criticism of vanity, but what did she, what did she recommend for him? A crown and a throne. And so what he's essentially saying, without saying it in so many words, is I am now leading an army that is fighting against monarchy, right? Against crowns and thrones. And if I were to endorse your elegant lines, people would think I want to be King George IV. So I'd like to do it, but I can't do it. But I can do the, the next best thing. I can entertain you if you can come to Cambridge. And she did. So... So there's Washington, right? And this is 1776. He still has a long way to go in the maturation of his soul and mind about slavery. Look, however, look at how Thomas Jefferson refers to her. Religion, indeed, she was, she was uh, by the way, she was converted by uh, the first great awakening and probably uh, under George Whitfield's ministry. Religion, indeed, has produced a Phyllis Waitley, he can't even take the trouble to spell her name correctly, but it could not produce a poet. See, she's, re yes, she's religious, but she's not a poet. The compositions published under her name are below the dignity of criticism. I'm not even going to talk, they're so bad. You see the condescension, don't you? It's just dripping. This is the only book he ever wrote, by the way. Long Life, Notes on Virginia, the only book he ever wrote. And he's willing to go on record as saying this Phyllis Wheatley. Yeah. So you see the difference, don't you? Washington is able already, he's growing beyond the race prejudices of his class in Virginia. Jefferson, th this book isn't published until the late 1780s. I don't know that Jefferson ever grew beyond those prejudices. Now Jefferson, to give him his due, you gotta give the devil his due. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that at Regent University. So uh, can we edit this uh, thing, Bill, after, after it's done? 
he does go on record, Jefferson does. I mean, he, he advances a bill in the Virginia legislature for, to make legal manumission, so the willful freeing of slaves by slave owners. But I don't know that he ever outgrew his own race prejudice the way that, that Washington did. So I want you to see these two side by side. Okay, so that's uh, there's so much we could uh, so much we could talk about. Um, well, let's let's move forward here a little bit. Let's keep going. Well, I think we should think just a little bit about the revolution itself, right? That Washington led. What is the great principle of that revolution? And Lincoln, a very very keen, uh, very keen student of the American founder and commentator on it, a very apt namesake for this program. What does Lincoln say? I've never had a feeling politically that didn't spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. Now, of course, Washington didn't sign it. He wasn't there in Philadelphia. He's already in the field. But had he been there, had he remained in the Continental Congress, he surely would have signed that, right? That document that contains, as Lincoln says, an abstract truth. Lincoln says it's a merely revolutionary document, and he says it could have done the work of separating us from Great Britain and arguing our case before the world without that assertion of human equality. Lincoln says the great genius of Jefferson and the Congress is to embalm, what a strange word, huh? Macabre word, embalm. You embalm a dead body, right? To keep it from decay for some future use, maybe a viewing, open casket funeral or something like that. So that today, oh yeah, and it's a truth that's applicable to all men and at all times. So that today, 1859, and in all coming days, it'll be a rebuke and stumbling block to the very harbingers of re reappearing tyranny and oppression. Washington fought to vindicate that revolution, yeah. Maybe we can come to this in questions and answers, but I've got, a, I've got, I think, a pretty good case to make for why all men are created equal meant all persons are created equal, black and white and all races and all sexes and all social conditions throughout all time. And, and the, the, the original draft of the declaration, I think, can, can make that case, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna press on here. All right, let's go to the constitution now. And again, this is a little departure from your assigned readings. And I didn't wanna just stand up here and read to you stuff that you've already read. Um, Yeah, actually, let's, oops, let's go back here just for a moment. Let's go, go back here. Okay, Fairfax Resolves, Declaration of Independence. Right around this time, Washington uh, writes a letter to, to one of the Fairfaxes for whom Fairfax County is named. This is the family who are his next door neighbors. What's now Fort Belvoir, if you ever go in that section of Northern Virginia. It's right adjacent to Mount Vernon, present day Mount Vernon. Well, Belvoir was the name of the Fairfax estate. And after Washington's father died, uh, they became sort of his foster family. They became models for him of, of uh, British liberalism and gentility and so forth. He's very close to them. They're his foster family basically. But he breaks with them in the years leading up to the revolution. He breaks over principle. And uh, he writes to, to one of the Fairfaxes and he says, <clears throat> the crisis is arrived. This is on page 99, by the way, of the readings that you have. The crisis is arrived when we must assert our rights or submit to every imposition that can be heaped upon us till custom and use shall make us as tame and abject slaves as the blacks we rule over with such arbitrary sway, closed quote. So let's unpack, unpack the words a little bit. Tame, 
abject, abject slavery. It's a bad word. It's a bad condition to be in, right? It's not good. It's not good to be an abject slave. It's not good for you. It's not good for your slave master. And how do, how do we whites, <clears throat> we slave hold, holders, I should say, how do we rule over our slaves, he says, with arbitrary sway? What does the word arbitrary mean? Anybody? Anybody? Yes, sir. Without reason. Without reason. That's really, that's really good. That's well said. I'm glad you know it. It's not a word we tend to use that much. Um, it's not a word students tend to know. When they ask me at the beginning of the semester, how are you going to grade us? I usually say, with arbitrary and capricious reasoning. Yes. And they're all like, that sounds good. OK. I'm like, no. No, arbitrary is without reason. You don't have a reason. You just do it. It's just fiat. And as a matter of fact, it connotes something even worse, right? That it's, that it's capricious. It's not based on nature. It's not based on reason. So already, right? This is Kirk of 1774. This is an admission that slavery is merely arbitrary. It's unnatural. It's, it's a violation of the laws of nature and nature's God. All right, now let's think a little bit about this uh, Constitution. Now, the Constitution. <clears throat> It was a source of argument in its day, even before it was ratified. It's been a source of argument up to the present day. It was a source of virulent argument in the years leading up to the Civil War. This is, anybody know who that guy is on the left there? Yeah, good for you. And who was William Lloyd Garrison? He was the editor of The Liberator and was the most vocal white immediate emancipationist. Good for you, immediate. Yeah, radical emancipationist. Yeah, good. Who's on the right there? Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, yeah. So a white northern abolitionist with no personal contact with slavery, a black southern former slave born in Talbot County, Maryland. Almost certainly his owner was his father, though he never knew for sure. Uh, escapes to freedom, becomes perhaps with Lincoln, the, the most eloquent voice of the 19th century and anti-slavery voice. Well, Garrison, conceiving a hatred for slavery, conceived a hatred for the Constitution, which protected it for 20 years. And he called it, I bet you know this probably by heart, he called it, the Constitution, a covenant with death and an agreement with hell. It goes on to say, which should be immediately annulled. He, he spoke these words in, on the 4th of July, 1854. And then he burnt a copy of the Constitution in public, and he put it on the ground, and he trampled on it. And then he called for secession. Right? Before, the, before the Southerners are going to do it, years later, he called for Northerners to secede. He said, we should break away from the South, form our own free government, so that will not be tainted, will not be infected with this wickedness, right? And the Constitution, which protected it for 20 years and which had a fugitive slave clause in it, right? He says, that's a pact with the devil. It's demonic. You bet it's a white supremacist document, Garrison says. There are folks today, right, who take up this cry. Some of them teach in universities, some of them perhaps, uh, you know, write op-ed pieces and what have you. So, but look what Frederick Douglass says. <clears throat> Again, the man who had literally felt the lash of the slaveholder. He says, in effect, to Garrison, also in a speech on the 4th of July, he says, no, it is not. It is not a white supremacist document. It is not a, an inherently racist document. It is not a pro-slavery document. It's not a pact with the devil. He says it is a glorious liberty document. And I've transcribed this exactly as Douglas wrote it. So he himself capitalized those words. This comes from uh, uh, an address of his. What to the slave is the 4th of July? Probably you've encountered that. And he goes on to say, 
Garrison, those of you who hold the white supremacist view, he says, that is a slander upon the memories of George Washington and James Madison and the framers of that constitution. He says, it is not a white supremacist document. Then he runs through a list of reasons why. So let's think about that for a minute. We can't, we can't exhaust the subject, but we can at least make a pass at it, shall we? Here's the uh, here's a famous painting of the signing of the Constitution, and I commend to you my friend Daniel Dreisbach's recent piece in Law and Liberty. He's been the first person. So this was this was uh, commissioned and finished in 1940, right right before the U.S. enters World War II. But already the Battle of Britain is ongoing. He's the first person to notice this. There's an open Bible there. No one since 1940 has noticed this. Uh, and so he's just written a piece, published a piece on it in the Law and Liberty blog. But anyway, so that's the scene. There's Washington presiding over the Constitution. So he, he must bear some responsibility, yes? Did he draft Article 1, Section 9, word for word with his own hands? No. But did he preside over those debates and lend his moral authority? Yes, certainly. Did he sign the Constitution? Yes. Did he send it out to the 13 state governors over a letter that he wrote and signed? Yes. So let's look at one, let's look at one section of the Constitution. Yeah, I got I wish I could take you through some of the debates. You know, you know, there are principled moral religious debates. What we would call them kind of high order debates, high road debates. And then well, one of them is given by George Mason, who's the second largest slaveholder at the Constitution. Washington is the largest slaveholder. Mason says, look, it's, it's a national sin, slavery is. God is going to judge us. Providence punishes national sins by national calamities. The judgment of heaven is going to fall on a country that practices slavery. And when it looks like he's beginning to sway the delegates to maybe have a, a complete anti-slavery passage in there, a man from South Carolina stands up, John Rutledge. South Carolinians are always causing trouble. <laughs> they are. Yeah, blame them for this. There's a nullification crisis in the 1830s, you know. They're the first, that's they, right, who opened fire on Fort Sum. Very pestiferous people down there. But uh, at any rate, Rutledge stands up and he says, look, religion and humanity, they got nothing to do with this question of slavery. If you people continue to press for an anti-slavery passage in there, what's gonna happen? North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, we're gonna walk. You won't get your union, you won't get your constitution. We'll, we'll remain under the Articles of Confederation. It's interest, he means financial interest, right? Financial interest, that's what governs nations, he says. So Washington is hearing this discussion, presiding over it. Let's go here, Article 1, Section 9. Mm. I want to get to his will. I want to get to this. Can we, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to tantalize you with this. Maybe we can deal with this in the questions. All right. The takeaway is this, is this is a passage which partakes of, I think, both natures. Little pro, little anti-slavery. My own take is that on balance, this is an anti-slavery provision. It would take too long to go, to go through it. And I, I want to get to his will. But tuck this away. Go back and reread. Uh, that and commentary on it, if you if you like. Um, I think I want to go to the will, and then we'll, that'll leave us enough time for questions. And if you like, we can come back to this. I hope you do. I hope you would like. Uh, okay. So in his retirement years, what does Washington do? Um, well, for one thing, he's reading tracts, anti-slavery tracts. <clears throat> you may know the name Granville Sharp. Granville Sharp was part of the Clapham sect, the Clapham community of William Wilberforce. They actually all lived together. They worked together 
on the monumental task of ending the slave trade in Great Britain. When it was at its zenith, it was an entrenched economic uh, political interest. It seemed an impossible task, but Wilberforce eventually prevails and his sect prevail. Granville Sharp was the sort of encyclopedist of them. It was he who gathered the facts and produced reports and things like that. Um, and so Washington had this in his library, the just limitation of slavery in the law of God. He had a 1776 copy. I'm not sure when he acquired that. But here's another one. By the way, George Washington had a first rate library. This is another of the myths, right? I was talking about the big dumb jock myth. This is part of it. Washington had one of the best libraries in early America in terms of number of volumes and weight of volumes. And almost all historians for decades and decades repeated this patently false notion that Washington just had a few tracks about agriculture in his library. I, I don't know how it, got, how it got past fact checkers. But anyway, here's one that he acquired. This, didn't, this wasn't published until 1793. So this is in his retirement years, right? He's trying to get back his wealth that he's lost in the revolution and he's hunkered down at home. It's got a long title, An Oration Upon the Moral and Political Evil of Slavery. This was a speech that was given by a man named Dr. George Buchanan in Maryland before a, uh, an abolitionist society. So Washington is reading these tracts. He's, he's thinking about uh, how to dispose of himself and his property at his death. Washington died at the end of 1799. Uh, he was 67, about to turn 68. That sounds young to us, uh, but the men in his family tended to, tended to die young, and he expected to die young. Um, so according to family lore, and here I'll just read a few, few lines from this. One night in July of 1799, the general dreamt of his own death. The next morning, he sat down to amend his will to dispose of his property and to dispose of himself. He wanted to be buried there at Mount Vernon. Um, the, the, a vault had been built for him in the, in the new Capitol building or was planning to be built uh, where his remains to be were, were to be interred. And he said, no, I, I just wanna be buried here at Mount Vernon. I just wanna be buried beneath my fields. None of this Napoleon stuff. Napoleon's already on the scene by then. Anybody been to Paris? Good for you, good for you. Those of you who haven't, you should go sometime. I just took my kids to Paris last summer and we drove by, we drove right by the Hotel des Invalides, the big and the gigantic sarcophagus that Napoleon designed for himself. That's where the Napoleon complex comes from in psychology, right? Washington, he doesn't need all that, right? He's physically a giant, but he doesn't need all of that stuff. He says, I'll just, I just want a nice Republican grave, small r, just a nice Democratic grave. Just bury me under my fields at Mount Vernon. But he's thinking about his property, what to do with it. And uh, he decides to free his slaves, the slaves he owned outright. Not, that is to say, not the dower slaves that came as the dower with Martha. And so, um, he provides for that. He frees all of those slaves, but not at his death, not even, at, not even immediately, but at Martha's death, at Martha's death. So here is, uh, oops, I'll come back to this. Here is the actual copy. You can see it. I've seen this. It's in the um, Fairfax County Courthouse in Fairfax City there, right by the circle. As you can see, we have to reconstruct a little bit of the words and letters, but uh, it's, it's not a problem. We know exactly word for word what it said. And one of the things that it says is that, uh, well, how shall I put this? Yeah. So a few years earlier, he had written that uh, he wanted to see, quote, laws which would eradicate slavery by slow, sure, and imperceptible degrees. 
But by 1799, he says, I need to make an example. And he becomes the first major slaveholder to free his slaves of the founders. And uh, he does it in very, very, he adopts the tone of command, right? I mean, he's a general after all. And he, sets, he notes that he set up a fund, a trust fund that will pay out for the freed slaves and then their descendants, quote, so that they'll be taught to read and write and brought up to some useful occupation, close quote. And clearly he's thinking about citizenship for them eventually. And listen to that imperious tone. I do moreover most pointedly and most solemnly enjoin it upon my executors hereafter named to see that this clause respecting slaves, so you see to it, my executors, you see to it that upon Martha's death, these slaves are freed and they are paid with these trust monies for education, for learning a trade and so forth. To see that this clause respecting slaves and every part thereof be religiously fulfilled without evasion, neglect, or delay. And he underlines that. Right. All right. So let's pause here for a moment and address one criticism, and then I'll stop and we'll take, we'll take questions. So some people have said, um, yeah, but so it's easy to do this on paper, right? It's just a, it's just a gesture. He's not really that serious because it's, it's after Martha's death, and maybe he's not even serious about it at all. Maybe he's hoping that uh, they'll stay in the family or whatnot. Well, there was actually, there were two reasons for it. One reason is uh, he wants Martha to be cared for and provided for, so she's a semi-elderly widow. She will be when Washington dies, and he doesn't know how long he's going to live. Actually, just lives six months after he amends this will. But that's the first. The second reason is this, and this often is overlooked uh, by historians. Uh, there, was, there were legal provisions left over from the common law of England here in Virginia that uh, a widow, upon the death of her husband, her property would be taxed at a third, at the rate of a third. It's called the widow's third. So if, if Washington had freed the slaves upon his death, a third of them would have been handed, would have been sold, and those profits would have been used to pay death taxes. So his, his hope that all of them would be freed would have been thwarted. And what would have happened? Slave families would have been broken up, probably. The, 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 the ones in, uh, in their primes would have been sold because they would have brought the highest price. So you see, you see how thoughtful this is. He's trying, to, he's trying to ensure that his wishes will be fulfilled, his wishes to, to free all of those persons. And he had set up a trust fund that had so much principle in it, it was still paying out to the grandchildren of his freed slaves in the 1830s. It's a lot of money. Did Thomas Jefferson do that? No. Even if he'd wanted to, he died, by our standards, millions of dollars in debt. Jefferson did. He doesn't have a very good head for business. Washington, much smarter when it came to finances, much smarter, much cleverer as a politician too, I might add. Well, that takes us up at least to Washington's death. And so uh, I wanna make good on my promise to give you a few minutes for questions and comments. So thank you for your attention thus far. And let's take uh, questions or comments. Dr. Redinger, do you wanna recognize them or, or may I do that? Question that you'd like to ask Dr. Morrison. Thank you so much for your comments. Oh, thanks. Anything? Questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Right at the end, you're talking about the widow's one third tax. George Washington get around that? I missed that. Yeah. Uh, he frees the slave. The provision is that the slaves are to be freed at Martha's death because under the rules of coverture and, um, and this widow's third, which is, a which is a holdover from the English common law, a third of that estate would have been taxed and they would have sold some of those slaves to pay that, that, those death taxes down. 
So he, he circumvents that by stipulating that they are to be freed after Martha's death. Then they all can be freed and they are not subject to that death tax that she would have had to pay on the estate as, as a widow, as a femme soleil is the, is the term, term of art in the law. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, sir. You want, you want to talk about that article one, section nine, don't you? No, I'm just kidding. You, no, no, you go right ahead. You go right ahead, please. Uh, I was Go just going to ask, during these times, President, did Washington try to introduce any kind of uh, legislation or recommend the Congress push forward any legislation anti-slavery? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. The answer is no, to my knowledge, though he does have some correspondence. Uh, there is a Dalby or Darby case that he's, he's asked to arbitrate, not in his official capacity. Um, <clears throat> so Washington believed this about legislation. And uh, he believed that slavery was a moral and political and religious evil that needed to end. But he insisted that it ought to be done legislatively. He had hoped to avoid what we get, which is a civil war, right? In which 700,000 people die. So as president, does he ask for legislation that would go through? No, no, he doesn't. He hoped to see it. He wanted it, but he, this is hard for us to get, get, our, get our minds around, I think, because we live post-Civil War, post-Woodrow Wilson, post-World War II. For us, almost everything is a national question. Um, as Tocqueville predicted too, or it's a, it's a national legal question, Tocqueville says in America, Every political question eventually becomes a legal question, you know. Um, but if you, if you look, say, if you look at Article One, Section Nine, just off the top of my head, what does it say there? The states, the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper. Slavery is a state matter. It is not, again, as I read this, it is not a national matter. So that's Washington. I think this helps to explain his silence as president uh, and his reluctance to introduce legislation. They also had, now Washington is a fairly vigorous executive, but he's got no precedence to go on, right? He's the first one. Um, but even he, even he as a vigorous executive, believes that the, strange as it may be for us to think, that the, it's the legislature's job to legislate. It's not the executive's job. It's not the judiciary's job. So he, he would have welcomed, I'm sure, legislation, but he did not move it himself. Partly because of this understanding of federalism, where the national government or the federal government has, can be very powerful, but in a sort of a silo fashion, but it doesn't have broad, broad powers, the kind of broad powers that we think it should have in 2023. But, and, and also it's a state matter. It's a state matter. It's not a national matter for them. Yes, sir. So I understand that at the time, uh, and the Washington South is a state issue, but if Washington, as you've shown, also understood this to be a moral matter, that it was morally wrong, then yep. would that not in time supersede this state matter and at least um, cause one to think that something more serious should be taken? I mean, as it yeah. says there, right, that um, it should be prohibited um, prior to the year 1000 after it doesn't ban slavery after each after it only says you can't ban it until 1800. Right. So, right. I, for example, they could have said, all right, after we won't ban it. Yeah. I guess my question is, is the moral imperative how to overtake the state battle? Right, right. Uh, for Washington, no, I don't think so. The, the rule of law is, is the rule of law. What, whether it is statutory law or natural law has to prevail. For Washington, his hope was, now that we have thrown off what we consider to be a tyrannical empire and set up on our own, 
The first time in human history that it happened, by the way. We got to think about that when we criticize people who lived 200 and some years ago. I mean, they're doing something that had never been done in human history before. Never. No colonies had broken away from an empire and set up on their own in the history of the human race. It's not an easy thing to do. And somebody like Washington is, I think, he, he has two skill sets. One is a destructive skill set, right? He's, in a way, he's a radical. It's a radical thing to take up arms against your government, right? And he had called George III's grandfather, George II, the best of kings. He himself had wanted a commission in the regular British army. He was a proud Briton. He was a proud member of the empire. So he, he comes to think, though, that that empire is becoming increasingly tyrannical. So he's got that set of skills, but he also has constructive skills, right? To preside over a new constitution. And that too is a, right, the, the founders, they got this phrase for it, yeah? A novus ordo seclorum. Uh, Bill, is that an E or a U? I think so too. We'll put a little question mark after that. A new order of the ages. It's new. It's a, it's a new thing. It's the first modern nation, first natural rights republic. It's the first nation whose founding we can put on a calendar, which was accomplished by men whose names we know. Can't say that about the French or the Germans or even the founding of Rome, for goodness sakes. I have to have recourse to these boys suckled by a she-wolf, you know, and Romulus, that's where Rome comes from, right? Um, not so us, it's not mythical. We're the first nation founded on moral principles. It's a moral principle that all persons are created equal. We're the first nation formally to separate church from state. The list goes on and on. So this is all new stuff. And, and I think, I guess what I'm saying is uh, I'm making a plea. I'm going back to old Krev Kur, right? You're never gonna find a nation, a society that's perfect where good and evil are not intermixed. Uh, so an, an awful lot of novelty comes out of that founding and it sets the conditions for the ultimate end of slavery. After all, it's the union, isn't it? It's the constitutional union that makes possible the Emancipation Proclamation and the war, right? That ends slavery and the 13th Amendment that outlaws it and the 14th and 15th Amendments that guarantee the civil liberties of former slaves and their descendants. It's the union itself that does it. So I guess my, uh, well, thus endeth the sermon, but you know, my, I'm sermonizing to say, I think we can cut these people a little slack sometimes. And maybe, maybe you don't have to be perfect to be good, to have done something noteworthy uh, and, and that we can celebrate. And by the way, I'd, li I'd like to see him knock down the Washington Monument. I get, maybe it's going to happen, but I just... <coughs> There's a second thing you're going to have to edit out, Bill. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know. Was that an adequate answer to your question? Yeah. Uh, we are over time, but I think oh. we'll just one more. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, Please. So just two things really quick. First of all, Kravikar obviously never visited Romania. Otherwise, you'd have a different view of society and civilizations. Second, I have a question. Do you think George Washington, from a legal standpoint, would have agreed with the Emancipation Proclamation? Boy, um, I'm I'm always I'm always hesitate hesitant to say what would the founders think or do, and it's, it's going to sound like I'm weaseling out of your question, but I, I'm going to preface it by saying that's always a dangerous thing to do, because. We can look back and we can find analogs in their time, but Washington would have to understand everything that had happened between 1799 and 1863, when the Emancipation Proclamation is proclaimed. As a president, he acts vigorously, so he's not opposed to 
Well, the, em the Emancipation Proclamation is in essence an executive order, isn't it? So would he have been opposed to that kind of exercise of presidential power? Probably not, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, he, he expected, and I think here Lincoln is right. Lincoln said the founders, almost to a man, expected that they had put slavery on the road to ultimate extinction. Washington lives long enough to see uh, the cotton gin invented, cotton engine, gin is short for engine. That's 1793, I think. But I don't know. If he had seen slavery as entrenched as it had become in the South by 1863, I can almost say for a certainty he would have been against secession. And actually, there's an anecdote uh, where he kind of has an over the fence conversation with one of his neighbors in, in Northern Virginia, where he says, if it ever comes to this, if we ever fight a civil war over slavery, I'm going to move to the North, he says. I'll become of the Northern, is the way he put it, uh, because he could not see himself defending slavery. Uh, so on principle, as, as an executive order, I think, OK, but that's not what you're asking. You're asking, would he have been in favor of that kind of sweeping, immediate freedom? I don't know. Maybe in the midst of a civil war. That's what he hoped to avoid, right? That's why he always insisted it needs to be done legislatively. After all, um, Lincoln's, Lincoln's proclamation is not a legislative act. He claims to do it under the war, what he calls the war powers of the president. And that's a pretty loose construction of the Constitution. But in the midst of a civil war by January of 1863, I don't know, 300,000 men dead by then, probably. I don't know my figures exactly, but there will be 620,000 will die of wounds, another 80,000 or so what we would call collateral damage. So about 700,000 people dead, maybe 300, 400,000 people dead, he would say. I had hoped to avoid this sort of thing, but now that we're in the midst of it, yes, this is the cleanest way to end it. I don't know, it's pure speculation though, on my part. Bill, so we're done? All right, thank you.